Hello everyone and welcome to the jQuery section of the course. Let's briefly break down what jQuery is and why you would want to use it. Keep in mind this course is not meant to be a full course on JavaScript in any way. There's a lot more JavaScript can do than what we've covered in this course and there are many other libraries for it such as Angular, React, Node.js. Really this course is not going to cover any of those topics because they're outside the scope of this course and we won't really need them to build a full web application. What we do is we learn JavaScript and jQuery in order to use them with Django later on. So what is jQuery? Well jQuery essentially is just a JavaScript library and it's a large single .js file that has many pre-built methods and objects that really simplify your workflow, specifically when you're interacting with the document object model and making HTTP requests through the use of AJAX, which we're going to talk about when we talk about Django later on. Previously, we've learned how to interact with the DOM using what's known as vanilla JavaScript, which is another way of saying just plain JavaScript. And we were able to use methods such as document.getElementById, and later on we learned about methods such as document.querySelector. When jQuery was first created, the more robust and convenient methods such as .querySelector and .querySelectorAll actually didn't exist in vanilla JavaScript. So jQuery was created as a way to help simplify interactions with the DOM. And one of its main features is the use of the dollar sign. So how do we actually get jQuery? Well, we have two options. One is to link a CDN hosted file, like we did for when we were using Bootstrap. And then the other one is to actually download the .js file from jQuery's official website and just link to it locally using a script tag. So again, once you've connected to the jQuery using the script tag in your HTML, then you can call the specialized jQuery calls that allow you to interact with the DOM. And let me show you a few examples of how jQuery differs from vanilla JavaScript. So on top we have what a jQuery call looks like, and on the bottom we have what a vanilla JavaScript looks like. Here you can see that we basically replace the document.querySelector all call in normal JavaScript with a single dollar sign. And here, both of these jQuery and vanilla JavaScript calls are grabbing all the elements that are under a div tag. And hopefully just from this clear example, you can see that you're going to save a lot of typing and a lot of work with the simple dollar sign command that jQuery has. Let's imagine another situation where you actually want to edit the styling of a certain variable. So here with jQuery, we have some variable called el. And here we've grabbed el and we said dot CSS, border width, and then set it to 20 pixels. In vanilla JavaScript, you would have to call el.style dot border width is equal to 20 pixels. So hopefully you can see now that jQuery basically allows you to just input any property of CSS, any style property, directly using the dot CSS method, and then as a second argument, what you want the change result to be. And that's a better workflow as far as uh, being more robust. And then finally, let's show you something that would be a function call with jQuery versus vanilla. So on the bottom here, you have vanilla, where you're saying, is the document in a ready state loading? If not, add an event listener, DOM content loading. Here, jQuery can do this all in one simple line of code. OK, as you can see, some situations are helped tremendously by jQuery, while others may not really necessitate it. Due to its massive popularity, it's still very important to understand it, because you're going to be running into it a lot in the real world. And if you didn't know jQuery, you would end up reading someone else's code and just be flabbergasted why these dollar sign calls were everywhere. Okay, so let's start learning how to interact with the DOM with jQuery. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to part one basic jQuery. In this lecture we're going to start off learning how to interact with the DOM with jQuery and the relevant file for this lecture is part one underscore mydocument.html. We're going to be using the console for our commands, but we're also going to show you how you can link your own HTML file to jQuery. Let's hop over to the browser to get started. Okay, here I have my editor open with the file I just referenced, part one, my document. And then I also have it linked here in my browser as well as code.jquery.com. First, I wanna briefly walk through this HTML file. You'll notice here I have a style call and that's basically just in lieu of a CSS sheet but I have a turn blue class, which is a color white, background blue, and then a turn red class, which has the text color be white, but the background be red. So keep that in mind as we continue through this lecture. But you'll also notice that not only do I have a link to Bootstrap, but I also have a script call here that connects me to jQuery. 
And let me show you how you can actually grab that yourself. All you have to do is go to code.jquery.com, that's C-O-D-E dot J-Q-U-E-R-Y dot C-O-M, and this will take you to this website showing you the latest stable versions of the CDN for jQuery. And then you can just come here, and we're going to be using jQuery 3, and you'll have a couple options, uncompressed, minified, slim, and slim minified. Basically, these are just variations on how large the file size is. If you get uncompressed, that's the largest possible. If you do slim minified, that's probably the smallest possible. And what you can do is just click on any of these. So we can do fully uncompressed. And you can just copy this and then paste it into your file. And that will give you the source for the actual .js. And if you're interested in this, you can actually just copy this link right here and then put it into your browser. And this will actually be the entire .js file. So this is what jQuery is. It's just this really large file. Um, and this is the uncompressed version. If you come back here and check out the slim minified version, we click on that link and then grab that HTTP and put that in your browser. You'll notice that this is uh, much slimmer and way more condensed. So it makes for a smaller file because it doesn't have as much white space. Although good luck reading this because it's frankly way too compressed for any normal person to read it. All right, moving along, let's get started with selecting of jQuery. What I'm going to do now is just expand this and then open up my console here. So I will inspect, open up my console, and now I'm ready to go. So to confirm that you have jQuery loaded, what you should do is just type in a single dollar sign, hit enter, and if you see some function come out, then you know that jQuery has been loaded. And you can test this again by saying dollar sign and then passing in a tag that you want to grab. So if you're using jQuery and you want to grab everything with a tag, you can just type in dollar sign and then in parentheses whatever tag you're interested in. So for example, for heading one, if I get that, then I get back everything that has heading one as a object there. And for example, if I want to grab all the list items, I say li and then I get back what is sort of like an array. It's not quite an array, but it basically acts like one as far as indexing purposes of the list items. And then you'll notice that I have a special list. So one of these has an ID of special. Okay, let's save this to a variable. I'll say var, and we'll call my variable x, say dollar sign, heading one, hit enter. And then with this, with jQuery activated, if I want to edit any of the CSS properties, it's really easy. I just say x.css, and then it takes in two parameters, the first one being the CSS property. So let's say the color, and then the second one being whatever you want to change it to. So let's change heading one to be red. And there you see immediately on top there, selecting of jQuery has been turned red now. And if I want to change the background, I can say anything like CSS, background, and then pass in another color. Let's, for instance, make it really obvious with blue. So hopefully you can see now that working with jQuery just makes your life a whole lot easier, and especially when we're using Django later on in the course. Now you can edit multiple CSS properties at once. Instead of just passing in uh, one argument and one parameter, what you end up doing is just passing in an object. Let me show you what that looks like. So I can say a variable, new CSS, and this will be an object. So I'm going to be creating a JavaScript object right now, which remember it basically acts like a dictionary. So here I'll change the color to be white. I will change the background to be blue, which is essentially going to be keeping it blue. And then I'm going to create the border to be red. And then let's finish off our object. So if I see new CSS, I see I have this JavaScript object. And now what I can do is say x.css, pass in my JavaScript object, and then that's going to change all of them at once. So you can see it has now a border red, although you can't really see the border. So let's edit that a little more. Let's make the border something like 20 pixel, whoops, pixels solid red. And let's change the background to be something like green. Hit enter. 
and now let's run x.css new CSS again. And here we can see the green, the red, and the white. All right, let's revisit the topic of grabbing multiple objects at once. So we already saw that with the list items, but let me clear the page and show that again. If I create a variable and call it list items and set it equal to everything that has a list tag, I get back, if I check it out, what essentially looks like an array. Now technically this is not a JavaScript array. It acts more like what's known as a list in JavaScript or a node list, but instead what we're going to be showing you is how you can index particular items off of this. So if I call list items and say .css and change the style. So for instance, I say color is blue then it changes everything of a list tag, if we look at this, to the color blue. If I only want to grab one of them, what I can do is use the .eq method to grab a particular index item. And the way that works is you say list items .eq, and then pass in the number of the index you want. So for the very first one, it's going to be zero. And then off of this, you can call CSS and change whatever properties you want. So now let's change that color to something more obvious like orange. And if we come back here, expand this, I can see now the very first item in that list has been changed to orange and everything else is, has retained the color blue. Now you can also grab the last item by saying list items dot eq and then using negative indexing. So negative one will then return the last item. So let's make that color something like, well, let's just make it orange as well. We'll hit enter, and if we scroll down here, we see now that last item is orange. Okay, now let's talk about grabbing text and HTML. Remember, previously we had to use things like inner HTML or text content. jQuery makes that much easier. So I'm going to say dollar sign $h1, and I don't even really have to save it as a variable. I can just call the method or property right here, and it's going to be text. So this says selecting of jQuery. Remember, that's the text I have up here. And if I want to change that, all I have to do is pass in whatever new text I want. So I will say brand new text. And that changes the text. So again, it's just the variable, or in this case, I haven't even saved it to a variable. It's just the dollar sign call, and then dot text, whatever text you want. If you want to actually change the HTML, all you have to do is say, again, either your variable or your tag call, and then we can say HTML, close parentheses, that returns the actual HTML. In this case, there's nothing special about it. But if I want to edit the HTML, let's make it emphasized. I'm going to say EM, new, and then close EM. And just like before, you can't do this with just a text call, otherwise it won't actually take the tags into effect. And here I can see up on the top that it is in italics now, or emphasized text. Okay, finally let's talk about two more things, attributes and values, and then classes. So attributes and values are also very easy to deal with when you're working with jQuery. For instance, if we scroll to the bottom of this page, we see we have an input button. So we have this form with some stuff, and initially it says enter your name or something, and then we can click on submit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab anything that has input. So we can see there's two of these. There's the first one and then the second one. So both of these, this text box and this submit button. And what I'm going to be doing here is say input.eq1 and then if I want to actually affect the attribute of one of these inputs and remember the attribute can be something like what type of input it is. Remember when we're creating an input in HTML I have to specify what type it is whether it's a button, a radio button, a checkbox, submit, text area, etc. So all I have to say is ATTR and then just like with CSS the first argument is whatever the attribute you're looking for. So I will affect the type. And then the second one is what you actually want to change that attribute to. In this case, let's change the type to checkbox. And now that I've hit enter, I can see that submit button went away and it's now a checkbox on my screen.
All right, let's show another way to affect a value. So if I want to affect the value of this input text box here, what I can do is grab anything with input. And then what I'm going to say is dot EQ, grab the first item there, because I want to affect that text box, and then say dot VAL, which is going to be the value. And it's just a single parameter here, because we're specifically saying I want to affect the value of that text box. So I will say new value, I hit enter, and I see the text box value has been changed to new value. And that's special with the dot VAL call. All right. Now finally, whoops, I want to discuss classes. So remember we have CSS classes, and if we go back to our HTML document here, I see I have two classes, turn blue and turn red. So that's something to keep in mind. Let me refresh this page so we can get everything back to normal. Okay, and let me show you how you can add a class with jQuery. All you have to do is have a dollar sign here, select something, so let's select the header. In this case, it's H1 or actually, yeah, h1, and then if we want to add a class, all you have to do is call add class, and then the name of the class. So let's say turn red, and there we can see it turned red. If I want to remove a class, it's very similar process, call h1, and then call dot remove class, and then we can remove turn red. Now usually what you end up wanting to do is toggle class, not just add a class, because if we already have the red class on it, we want to remove the red class. If it doesn't have the red class already, then we want to add it. So the way you can do that is by using toggle. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to call h1 again, and let's show it with blue class. So I will say toggle class turn blue. And you can see it turned blue. But if I run the exact same line of code again, toggle class, it will turn it back off. So you can see that it's toggling it on and off. So now you don't have to worry about add class and remove class. You can just use toggle class instead. It really depends on your situation, whether or not you want to use toggle class or just a simple add or remove call, but know that you have the option there. All right, that's really all I wanted to talk about for jQuery for this particular lecture. Hopefully you saw how easy it is to work with jQuery, and if you want a reference for all the commands we just showed, you can just go to part one basic jQuery.js under the jQuery folder, and it has all the commands in a JavaScript file that we went through here in the console. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part two jQuery events. In this lecture, we're going to be using the same HTML file from the previous lecture, but we're also going to be connecting it to a JS file where we will be using jQuery to work with events. Let's get started by hopping over to the editor and the browser. Okay, so I have the HTML file from the previous lecture open here on the editor, as well as linked to in the browser. Now we're going to be linking this to our own JavaScript. So if we go all the way down, here I've added a script tag with the source myscript.js. Just change that to whatever .js you have in the same directory as this HTML file. Here's the empty.js, and let's show you some basic event handling with jQuery. First, let's talk about clicks. Imagine we want to have the heading one here change when you click on it. What you can do is say something like h1, and then you have the event call. So that can be something like click. And I'm going to show you a link later on. I actually have it here open in my browser with all the different type of event methods that you can call using jQuery. There are a ton of them available to you. We're going to be going over the most basic ones and the most useful ones. So dot click is definitely one of those. And inside of this is where you pass in your function that you want to have executed when something gets clicked, specifically heading one element here. So we're going to, let's just say we log something first. So there was a click. We will save that. And let's refresh this page and open up our console so we can actually see the log. Let me expand this a little bit. Here's the console. And I'm going to click on H1. And I see there was a click. Perfect. So it's all working out. Now let's expand on this idea by actually grabbing multiple elements. 
So there's only one heading one, but what if I pass in li? Well, this is actually going to basically work automatically, thanks to jQuery, where if I say console.log any li was clicked, save this, I refresh this page, and now if I click on any li item, you can see here that it keeps getting repeated. Perfect. Now, if you actually want to call methods or properties off whatever specific variable you're interacting with here, you have to use the this keyword. And let me show you an example of what that would look like. Imagine that I want to change the heading every time I click on it. Well, what you can end up doing is you call dollar sign, and in parentheses, you pass in the this keyword. And inside of an event call like this, the this keyword is referring to whatever object you are currently performing that event on. So we have this, and then off of that, you can call it just like the variables we saw in the previous lecture. So if I want to change the text, I just grab text, and then say, I was changed. So we will save that, and let's close this for now, and refresh the page. I'm going to click on heading one here, and we can see I was changed. So again, with jQuery, you kind of have this funky keyword with this, but also in combination with the dollar sign. So if we have an event call inside of the function, if we want to actually affect what's going on here, we have to have dollar sign, this, and then dot, and any of the previous methods we saw from the previous lecture. Okay, so that's the basics of clicks, and there's also things like double clicks, hover over, mouse over, there's a lot of stuff like that. And if you want the complete reference, they're all here in category events. For instance, let's say we're looking for double click. Well, I can expand this, zoom in. Let's say I'm looking for something that has to do with click or double click. Well, I can start typing click. I see the event handler for click, but I can keep searching. And here I see double click right below it with dbl click. So that's what I would have to call instead of click if I only wanted the event to listen for a double click. All right. Now for events, we are not just limited to things like clicks or mouse overs with just our mouse. We can actually perform actions on our keyboard, and that's known as a key press. Let's walk through a few examples of interacting the key press using jQuery. So I will use the dollar sign notation and grab the input tags. If we scroll down here, we see we have two input tags, the text box right here, and then submit. So I just want to grab the text one. So I will say EQ zero, since it's the very first input that shows up on the page. And then I'm going to call the method key press on this. And I will call a function to occur whenever I press a key inside of that text box. And what I'm going to have happen is I will change heading three. I'm going to toggle its class to turn blue. And let's save that. I'll refresh my browser over here. And now we'll see what happens as I begin to type in this box. We can see that the toggle class is toggling this turn blue on and off. So again, what's happening here? Well, I'm grabbing all the input tags, then indexing to grab the very first one, which is the text box, and then assigning a key press method to it, where every time I press a key inside that text box, this function occurs, and this function grabs the heading three tags, toggles their class to be turn blue. Okay, now we can actually grab an event object from this that has a ton of information. And let me show you how we can do that. Inside of this function, I can input the special keyword event. And I'm going to log this. So I will say console.log this event. And you can see that it's highlighted to indicate that it's a keyword. Now I'm going to refresh this page, and as I type, you'll notice I get a console log, and this is known as an event object. And this event object has a ton of information on it, which we're really not going to need to know, but if you scroll all the way down, there's a which property here. And if we click on that, we see that which is equal to 97, and that corresponded with the letter A. If I type B, then I get a new object, I'll open it up click on which, and we see we have 98. If I type the letter C, open up the new event object, scroll all the way down, I see I have 99. So there are actual number codes for every key on your keyboard, 
which makes sense because maybe I only want an action to occur when I hit enter or press W or press an up and down arrow key, which means we can actually specify event.which to grab a particular code. So let's see that in action. I'm going to say if event.which is equal to, and I'm going to use the key code 13, which is the enter key, I will change heading 3 to be toggle class turn blue. And let's save this. I'm going to refresh the page. And now we should see that as I type stuff, nothing really happens. It's not until I press enter, which I know you can't see, that the change occurs. So right now I'm just pressing enter on my keyboard and the change is occurring. For any other key press, nothing will happen. And that's how you can use the event object to grab information. And with key presses, dot which will tell you a numerical code that corresponds to the key. And you can just Google online for the numerical codes of specific keys on your keyboard. We're going to discuss two more things, and one is the on method, and the next one it will be effects and animations. But let's quickly show you what the on method looks like. The on method essentially acts like event, add event listener from vanilla JavaScript. So if I grab h1 and say dot on, I pass in an event. For instance, let's pass in double click. And then I pass in the function. And we can use the special this keyword to reference h1 here. And we'll say this, and we will toggle class to be turn blue. So what's happening here? I'm saying on double click call this function and this references the h1. So if I refresh this page every time I double click on this it's going to toggle this on and off and my highlighting is making it seem a little weird because when you when you double click something it also gets highlighted but hopefully you can see what I'm trying to convey here. And you can practice this on your own computer to get a better idea of it. All right. So let's show one last example. This is basically just like add event listener. So I can say something like mouse enter, save this, and this should actually be a lowercase e. Save that and refresh our page. And you'll see here as my mouse hovers over, it suddenly turns into blue. And now I can toggle the class just by hovering off and on. So now I can just have a single call with toggle class instead of the dual calls we saw back when I was using vanilla JavaScript. Okay, finally, let's talk about events and animations. Now you can go to api.jquery.com category slash effects to get more information about this. But basically, you can have animations or effects occur. We'll show you some very common ones. I'm going to say input.eq and now I'm going to grab the second input, which if we look back at the HTML, it's the submit button. So I want something to happen when I click on submit. So I will say on click function. And then I'm going to grab everything in the container class. Let's put this in quotes here. So grab everything in that container class and say fade out. And you can pass in a number here in milliseconds. So I'm going to refresh this. If I hit submit, let's close this before I do that. I'll eventually see everything fade out within three seconds. So what is actually going on here? Well, this is just an animation that is available to you with jQuery. And basically it's just fade out and you pass in a number of milliseconds that you want the fade out to take. There are many, many animations and effects available to you. Just to show you one more, you can use slide up. I will save this. Let's refresh the page. And as I click submit, 
I can see everything starts to get slide up or basically a wipe. And in order to get this back, I just have to refresh. Okay, so again, there's a link in the notes or you can just go to api.jquery.com slash category slash effects get the, to get the full list of all the effects available to you here. We won't really be playing around with these too much throughout the rest of the course, but uh, you may find when you're dealing with your own website, it may be fun to add in your own animation using jQuery. All right, so go ahead and check out the notes if you want to review anything we covered here. But hopefully you now realize that jQuery makes your life really simple and a whole lot easier, especially when working with the DOM. Coming up next, we're going to have a Connect4 game project we're actually going to make a working, a fully working front end website that has a Connect4 game on it. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part three, the front end project. For this project, we're going to be coding through the creation of a Connect4 game. And we're going to be heavily using jQuery for this project. And just a quick note, we probably are using jQuery more than we actually should. So I really want to focus your knowledge of jQuery for this project. We will be using jQuery to actually build out the Connect4 game, when in reality it would probably be a smarter idea just to use vanilla JavaScript arrays for a lot of the work here. We're going to be interacting with the DOM really heavily. So keep that in mind. We're going to be really focusing on jQuery for this project. There are many, many ways you could have built a Connect4 game using the front end stack that we know so far. This is just one way that heavily features jQuery and DOM. So this project is also completely optional. Feel free to only watch, to skip it completely, or to just tackle it straight on your own. This project will conclude our formal coverage of the front end stack. So really, if you've reached this point, pat yourself on the back. You've learned a ton already, and you've basically completed the entire front end stack and after this, we'll be talking about the back end with Python and Django. All right, let's take a look at what this project actually looks like when completed, and then you can decide how you want to approach the project. After that, in the next few lectures, we're going to be coding through the solution. I'm going to hop over to my browser and show you what the project looks like. Okay, this is what the project looks like. Upon starting the project, you get an alert that says, player one, enter your name, you will be blue. So I will just input player one, and then player two, enter your name, you will be red. So we can give this some other name. Let's just give it the name B. You hit enter, and then we see this screen. So it says, welcome to Connect4. The object of this game is to connect four of your chips in a row. And player one and player two alternate. But the thing is, you only get to pick a column. And that is the column where you're going to drop either your blue or red chip. And it has to go all the way down. So for player one, it's your turn. So we can pick this column and we can see our chip dropped all the way down. So as player B, if I also pick that column, it drops on top of that one. And we can continue this process until someone has won the game. Hopefully you're already familiar with Connect4. If not, you can always just read the rules. It's a very simple game. So here let's have blue win by connecting four. And once we've connected four, it says player one has won, refresh your browser to play again. And if I refresh my browser, I get the alerts again. So I will give player one A, player 2b, and here the JavaScript has loaded and I'm ready to play again. And that's really all there is to this game. So feel free to either completely skip this project, tackle it completely on your own, or just have a code along section with me coming up in the next few lectures. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the solution lecture, part one for the front end project where we're going to be coding through the solution for the Connect4 game. Let's get started by hopping over to our editor. Okay, so to get this project started, I have three files, an HTML file, a CSS file, and a JavaScript file. We're gonna start off with the HTML, then we'll style it with some CSS, and then finally, the majority of our time is going to be spent coding through the logic with jQuery and JavaScript. Let's get started with the HTML. So the HTML is actually quite straightforward. First, we just do the basic HTML call, we can give it the title connect4, save that. And then I want to link to Bootstrap as well as my own CSS file. So let's start with my CSS, which is, I have it just being called game.css. So let me save that. And then I'm going to copy and paste the CDN link for Bootstrap. And you can just copy and paste this yourself either from the notes or from boots getbootstrap.com. 
So there's a CDN for Bootstrap. Let's make sure everything's working just by saying hello in the heading and refreshing our HTML page. Okay, looks like it's connected and working. Let's start by putting everything into a div container so that we keep it organized and centered on the page. And I will make sure that it's completely aligned center by saying align center as a parameter in that div. And I'll have heading one say, welcome to connect four. I'll have heading two say something like connect four chips to win. And then H3 will say, let's start. I'm going to delete this, refresh, make sure everything's working. Looks like it's good. Now the task we have to accomplish is actually constructing the table that's going to be connect four. So what I'm going to do, and you don't have to do it this way, there's many ways you could build at this table, but I'm going to create a table row with each table cell, whoops, containing a button inside of it. And then something else I'm going to do is make sure I call table here. Let's put this row back inside that table. And then let's give this table a class equal to board so we can reference it later. Although this will be just the only table tag in our HTML, we could have just used the table tag to reference it later on, but we'll give it a class so it makes a little more sense. And then finally, type button. We don't need a name for this button and the button itself can be blank. So the idea is we're going to be clicking buttons on and off. We'll have them change color to depict whether the chip is inside of that area or not. And we need to add a couple more cells to this row. So we can just copy and paste this. There we go. So let's save that. It's going to be seven cells per row. And then I can just copy and paste this row and then continue on. And connect four has six total rows. So I need to do this five more times. Let's make sure that's one row, two row, three row, four row, five row, six row, I believe. But let's actually make sure of this by refreshing our page. Here I can see a little table, it's kind of messed up. And that's because it's actually not inside of our container class. So let's bring this div all the way down here save this, refresh, and I can see I have a seven cell across in the rows and six rows total. Great. Finally, I want to, in my HTML, connect my script. So I'm going to call script and I will connect this to, we can say source, and I actually don't need to specify the type for now. We'll call it myscript.js. That's what my empty file is called right now. And then I also want to connect it to jQuery. So again, we just copy and paste the CDN. I'm going to do that here. You can either do it from the notes or from code.jQuery.com. So we have our HTML all set up. What we're going to do now is style it a little bit so that these buttons actually make sense. And you can see here, I can kind of click on these buttons right now, but it's way too small. Okay, so to start off the CSS, I'm going to call dot board and then every button within that. And then let's give them all a width of 100 pixels. Forgot the colon. And a height of 100 pixels. Going to save this. And here we can see we're starting to get something that looks quite a bit nicer. So if I zoom out a little bit here, we now have our Connect 4 board. But let's keep styling it a little more. Let's give them all a background color that's gray. Right now they have a bit of a fade to them. So if we refresh, we can see they're all gray now. We'll give them a bit of a margin so that we have a little space in between them. Save that, come up here, refresh. That's nice. And let's make them round. So to make them round, we use border radius and we can just set this to be at 50% and that should make them circles. Okay, and then we get this kind of a weird effect over here when we click. And the way to get rid of that is by giving them a border. We'll give them a four pixel 
solid black border, save, refresh, and here we can see our board is now complete. Okay, so our HTML is done and our CSS is done. Everything looks to be styled correctly. Coming up next, what we're going to be doing is dealing with the majority of our code, which is all happening on the JavaScript side. Thanks everyone, and I will see you in the next lecture where we're going to pick up right where we left off. All right, so here I am from where we left off last time. We have the empty JavaScript file, so we need to be using jQuery and JavaScript to actually grab elements from the document object model. But what we also now have is the HTML and CSS done for our project. There's a couple things we're going to need to be able to do. One thing we need to ask for the player names and then assign them their colors, red and blue. And I've picked some shades using RGB. Then the next thing we need to do is figure out a function that can change the color of a button. So if I click somewhere here, I wanna be able to change the color of that button. Now remember, we also need to figure out what a button's color is. So I need to make two functions that are very similar to each other. One is to find what color a button is if I click somewhere on a row or column index. And the other one is if I su supply a row index and a column index to actually change the color. So we'll be programming those out or coding them out. Then I also need a function that checks what is the bottom most available row. So if I click on one of these columns, I want my chip to go all the way down until it finally meets the last available gray button. So if these start getting filled up, I don't want it to mess up. I just want it to drop all the way down to the first gray button it sees. And we're going to be creating a function called check bottom that will check for the bottom and then supply back the row. Then we need to create a function that checks if four inputs are the same color to actually check for connect four. And then we need to create the win checks. So we need to make a check for horizontal wins. We need to make a check for vertical wins. And then we need to make a check for diagonal wins. After that, we need to check some way that the game has ended. Either everything is filled up and nobody's won or somebody has won. After that, we want to actually create the game logic where we start with player one, Player one will select something, will fill it in, then it goes to player two, they'll fit it in. And as they keep filling it in, we keep checking to see if somebody's won. And once somebody has won, we end the game and ask if they want to play again or along those lines. All right, definitely check out the solution file for this. There are a lot of helpful functions there. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom of the solutions file, there are actually helper functions that are commented out to help you understand how a table row index and a table column index work. It's actually kind of backwards. For instance, the very bottom row, the index here is row index five. So I have to check from five, four, three, two, one, zero, instead of zero, one, two, three, four, five. And the columns kind of feel backwards as well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you're confused on the indexing, definitely check out all the way at the bottom of the solutions JavaScript file. There are some helper functions to help you understand. So one of them is change color on click. So you can click on any of them and it will change the color for you. And the other one is to actually report back the index location of any button you click. So those are there to help you. They're not actually there for the game logic. Let's get started. I'm going to be doing a mix of coding and then copying and pasting from the solution if there's too much code. So just to save time. I'm going to copy and paste the very first lines of code and walk through them. So here are the first lines of code. Here I can see I'm asking player one through a prompt, enter your name and you will be blue. And then I'm saying that player one's color is this RGB code that I found. And then I have player two and I'm saying player two, enter your name, you will be red. And I set them to an RGB value. So this is some RGB code for red. And this is some RGB code for like a light blue. And keep in mind, I'm using RGB because when we'll be using jQuery to change the actual color of the buttons, it expects a string in the form of RGB. And it also expects it with this sort of spacing here. So keep that in mind. That's why this is in this specific format instead of just like a hex code. Then I have game on, which is equal to true. That's going to be a Boolean variable that tells me whether the game is running or not. And then I have table here, which is just a jQuery call to table tr. 
Okay, up next, let's create a report when function. I, again, I'm just going to kind of copy and paste this one. So report when, it takes in a row number and a column number, and then it says U1 starting at this row, column, and this is just console log. So this is for a record for us, so that we can check at the very end, once the game is over, we log what was the winning move, what row number and what column number did they win at. This is not necessary for the actual code to work. This is just more of a convenience function for you as you're debugging. Now let's actually code something out manually. So I'm going to create a function called change color. And the change color function is going to take in a row index, a column index, and a color. And then we're going to return the table. Remember the table is just that variable we got with jQuery. I'm going to use EQ and then pass in the row index to grab a row. Then I'm going to find TD values for those rows. And then I'm going to say EQ call index. And then I will say dot find the button there. And then I will say CSS and then pass in background color and change it to color. So that's a lot of code. And there's actually a link to a Stack Overflow article that really helps you out with this specific command right here. So I looked up on Stack Overflow, how do I get a table cell by index using jQuery? So if I know the row index and column index of a table, how can I use jQuery to grab that particular cell value from a table? And they came out with this really nice code where you just have that table, EQ row index, find the table cell, and then EQ column index. And then we added find the buttons, so we know their buttons. And then we have CSS background, color, and then color. What I would recommend you do is just kind of follow along with this and keep adding it. So in the console of your browser, say table, EQ, and then say one, and then say dot find TD, then say dot EQ, and then some random column, and then say dot find button. So peel back the layers so you can understand it yourself. Next, what we want to do is create a function called return color, which is going to report back the current color of a button. And this is going to look virtually the same as the first function we just wrote, except in this case, we are not changing the color. So we don't need the colors to be a parameter and we don't need it to be an input here. And this will just report back the color. That way I can call it change, or excuse me, not change color, but we'll say return color or report color, whatever you want to call it. And this returns whatever color at this row at this column index for that particular button. The next function we're going to need is going to be the check bottom. And the check bottom function is going to take in a column index and then return the bottom row that is still gray. Let's actually code this one out. We'll say function check bottom. It takes in a column index. And we'll create a variable here called color report. And that's going to just be equal to the return color function. And we will start at five and then say col index. And the reason we're starting at five, whoops, don't actually want that set of brackets there. The reason we're starting at five is because I have a for loop and I'm going to go from, we'll change this to be row just so it's really clear. I'll start at row is equal to five and then I'm going to decrease the rows. So I'll say row minus minus and I will keep going in my for loop until row is zero, meaning row greater than negative one. So as long as row is greater than negative one, starting at row is equal to five, keep subtracting the rows. And for each of these, what I'm going to do is grab the color report and set it equal to return color at the current row at my current column index. And then I will say this, if the color report is equal to gray, RGB 128, 128, 
one, two, eight. Then I'm just going to return that row. Okay, so what's actually happening here? Well, I'm taking in a particular column index. So someone, let's imagine, is clicking on a column. And then what I'm doing is I'm grabbing a color report. Basically, this is just the initialization of this value, color report, since it's already going to start at 5. And that's return color at row index 5, column index. So I'm just going up the rows, searching for the first gray button that I have available. Then I want another function that will check to see if four inputs are the same color. So we want some sort of color match function. Let's create one. I'm going to say function color match check and it will take in one, two, three, and four as variables. And then we're going to return and now let's check if it matches each one. So I want to check if button 1 matches 2, and if button 1 matches 3, and if button 1 matches 4. And the other thing I want to check is to make sure that these buttons aren't gray buttons. So if I look at my board right now, I have connect 4 with gray buttons, so I don't want that to be a glitch or a bug. So I will say make sure 1 is not equal to the RGB color code, 128, 128, 128. And the other thing I also want to make sure is that if I'm checking for horizontal wins or checking for vertical wins and I accidentally start checking outside of the table cells, then I will get undefined calls. So I want to make sure that 1 is not equal to undefined. And that is my color match check. Essentially, it grabs four buttons. It makes sure one is equal to two, three, and four. And it also makes sure that one is not gray, so we don't have four gray buttons. And that we also don't have four undefined slots being matched together and thinking we have a color match. Now it's time to actually copy and paste the win checks. So we have three functions for checking wins, a horizontal win check, a vertical win check, and then a diagonal win check. Let me copy and paste this code here. It's a lot of code, so you may have to zoom out to really see it well, but I'm going to briefly explain it. But before I do that, let me just explain the general logic over at the actual board. So let me bring back the board over here. This is what the board looks like. If I want to check for a horizontal win, what I'm going to do is starting over here, I'll check if these four are equal to each other. If they're not, I'll move one over, check if these four are equal to each other. If not, move one over, check if these four are equal to each other. If not, I'll move one over, check if these four are equal to each other. Which means for every row, I need to do four horizontal checks. And I know I have then six columns. Which means if I come over here to horizontal win check, that's exactly what we're doing in the for loops. I'm checking the columns. So there's six columns here, meaning, excuse me, there are six rows level of rows, and there are four columns that I'm going to have to iterate through to check. And the phrasing here reflects that better than I just said. Basically, for the six rows, for four columns, do a color match check on row call, and then row call plus one, same row, call plus two, etc. So we're just moving along, checking these four. And then we're going to do that for six of these rows. And then I'm going to call report win so that I console log that a horizontal win occurred. And then I want to return true if there was a horizontal win check. If not, I'm going to just continue. So this is going to go all the way and it's going to return true if there's a horizontal win check. If not, if nothing happened, nothing's going to actually be reported back. This continue keyword is something we may not have encountered before, but it basically just tells the code to continue and not do anything. Another thing you could have just done here is log something or just alerted something. Probably a log so you're not constantly alerting your user. A log something like no match at row or call. Now if we scroll down, now we have the vertical win check. And it's doing a really similar thing. It's going for the six columns here. Or let's count how many columns we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven columns, which makes sense because it's going up to seven. And then the rows we need to check here 
are one, two, three, four, go up one, one, two, three, four, go up one more, one, two, three, four, and that's it. That's your limit. Other than that, you're already off the table. So here we can see that I am just going to go through the seven columns, go three rows off the bottom, do a color match check, and then report the win, return true if I get the vertical win check. Otherwise, I'm just going to continue doing these four loops. Then I have the diagonal win check. And this one's a little more complicated, but it's a very similar idea to the first two. Basically what I'm doing is I'm saying the very first horizontal, or excuse me, diagonal check happens right here. Hopefully you can see this along. And then I'm going to continue doing the diagonal checks that essentially have a negative slope. And then I'm going to do all the diagonal checks to have a positive slope. And this is where our for loops come into play. And then we have the color match checks. And we can see here, if we scroll over, for some of them I'm saying plus one, plus one, plus two, plus two. And the other ones I'm saying minus one, plus one, minus two, plus two. And that's basically the difference between the positive slopes for the diagonal checks versus the negative slopes for the diagonal checks. Essentially, whichever direction is going diagonal, from left up to the right or from left down to the right. Okay, so we have those three functions that check for wins. What I want to do is now actually create the game logic. For the next lecture, we'll be showing you how to create that game logic, as well as a few more helpful functions to really help us out as far as understanding how this game is working. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back. So far, we've had the winning checks and the functions that actually check the colors and change the colors. What we need to do now is create all the game logic through so using jQuery that will actually assign all this to happen on a click. So as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of an extreme use of jQuery. You would probably want to use JavaScript arrays and more stuff on the back end if you're actually programming this. But this is kind of just to show the power of jQuery if you really want to force it to use the document object model manipulation. I'm going to start with player run. So I will say variable current player is equal to the number one. And then I will have the current name be equal to player one. And then I will have the current color be equal to player color. Actually player one color, excuse me. So we start off with player one. So let's say that, start with player one. Then the next thing I wanna do is change the heading to indicate that it's player one. So I'm gonna use jQuery here to say h3.text and say player one, it is your turn, pick a column, to drop in. And then what I'm going to do is using jQuery, I will say board button on click call a function. And this function is basically going to call all my logic. Again, probably normally not what you would want to do but this is going to allow us to kind of show off what jQuery can do. That we, the fact that we can do this all through a DOM call instead of saving the tic-tac-toe board to an array or a nested array. So here I'm going to say a variable column and I'm going to need to recognize what column was chosen. And I can do that with the this call here. So this keyword is going to indicate what column the person clicked on. And then I can actually say closest TD to find the closest cell to this and then get the index of that. So that's the column and again there's a stack overflow link in the notes to indicate some terms that we didn't cover such as closest and then dot index. But off of that we need to then get back the bottom available row to change. So I'm going to say this variable bottom avail is equal to check bottom, passing in that column. 
and then I want to drop the chip in the column that is at the bottom available row. So I will call change color and pass in bottom avail, col, and then current color. And now we want to check if there's a win or a tie. So I'm going to say if there's a horizontal win check or there is a vertical win check that returns a boolean or there is a diagonal win check. Then what I'm going to need to do is end the game. And to indicate the game has ended, we can just do something like jQuery call h1 and change its text to say something like winning, let's say, whatever player we currently are on, which is the current player. Actually, it's going to be the current name. Current player is just the actual number, one which we'll show later on how we're actually going to switch from player one to player two. But we will say current name, you have one. So we actually changed the heading there. And we can change some other things too. We can do a fade out, so let's practice that. I'm going to say h3 dot fade out. So that's an animation that you can find on that jQuery link. And then I'm also going to do the same thing for h2 dot fade out. And in the solutions, this is actually done as a separate function. This whole win check is a separate function. And then it's call in fast. And you can also pass in milliseconds there. All right. So if I get either a horizontal win check, a vertical win check, or a diagonal win check, I'm going to change my heading one text to say current name, you have one. And then I'm going to fade out fast, fade out fast from the other three headings, or two headings, excuse me. Then what we need to do is recheck who the current player is and change the current player. So if I'm still continuing after this, it means there is no win or tie. So I'm going to say the current player is equal to the current player times negative one. And then I'm going to use that actual number to change the reassignment. So I will say if current player is equal to positive one, well then I know we're at player one. So I know the current name is player one. Remember that was the prompt from the very first lines of code. And then what I'm going to do is change using jQuery, my heading three, to say some text such as current name, it is your turn. And then else, I know it's the other player's name, so I'm going to say current name is equal to player two, and then change the heading for player two. We'll say h3 text current name, it is your turn. And then I want to change the current colors as well. So I will say current color is equal to player two color. And let's do the same thing up here. So here I will say current color is equal to player two color. Excuse me, player one color. So we can save that. And then we can continue if I come up here, I can change the color to the current color at the bottom available at that column. So this basically is going to keep cycling whenever I click the board. And that is all you have to do to actually make Connect4 work. Now I know I say that's all you have to do. This is quite a bit of effort, especially since we're really trying to juice the most out of jQuery instead of using something like an array. But let's actually save this and refresh our page and see if it worked. Going to refresh. I get player one into your name, let's call it A. Player two into your name, let's call it B. We'll hit OK. Let's see if I can drop it. Great. And then it says 
bit, it's your turn, or it should say B, it, it is your turn. So we will keep dropping it. And we can see here, let's practice getting a vertical win. And it says B, you have one. Perfect. And then I just have to refresh the page. I'll start again with A and then B. Let's get a horizontal win here. And looks, whoops, I accidentally clicked too many times, but I also got the horizontal win. And now let's make sure the diagonal win is working as well. So we'll make some player names. It's just junk. And let's make those names. We'll say, try to get blue to be diagonal here. And we're going to keep going. And there's the diagonal win. Great. All right. If you have any questions for this, feel free to post the Q&A forums. But something I want to make clear is really this is just an exercise to show it's possible with jQuery and the front end stack that we've learned.